Um, before we get started, I'd like to ask you a question. If you were coming from, like, if you're in the military's position, would you rather people believe that you are covering up uh, the secret truth of UFO and alien encounters and all of that? Or would you rather, like, let's say that's true and that's what you're, what you are covering up. You've been dissecting alien bodies, taking apart their technology, all of that, all of that's true. Would you rather people then think that's true? Or the alternative is if you guys have no fucking clue what's going on, you think there's probably some weird shit happening, but you have no idea what it is and you don't know where to start. But then people think that you're covering up dissecting aliens and taking apart their spacecraft. I mean, I, I think I'd want people to believe that even if I had no fucking clue what was going on. Yeah, I think I would want them to believe that because not... Because it's easier to discredit someone who thinks that, right? I think it just makes you seem much more in control than you actually are. Okay, okay. Yeah, I I see that point. I just think, you know, the idea that the government is covering up the existence of extraterrestrials, like, they would be doing that for a reason, and, and one of the reasons that people throw out that they would do that is because they don't, they want to maintain their power. They're afraid that this information would be yeah, absolutely. So- somehow destabilizing to the power dynamics that exist, the, the power paradigm. So can you see why it would be beneficial to somebody in either position? Yeah. 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 Especially, I mean, if it was something that was, but that's the thing. Like, what? I mean, we can speculate, I guess. But what's crazier than aliens coming to Earth and, you know, essentially by accident contacting our species, our government? You know, I guess the. I mean, the scarier thing is that um, the government also has no clear picture and has no real idea. That's one of the reasons I think they're fighting this. Um, you know, I, I think we've talked about it before, the um, the documentation that's being released. Um, I think we're going to learn that they are... Yeah, I think we're going to learn some uh, pretty embarrassing things that happen, but probably ultimately the we'll end up where we started, essentially, except we will just know that, you know, <laughs> we can't trust them. Well, they don't want to... <laughs> come across as incompetent. Actually, I have a yeah. I have a No, they don't. prescient note on this that I've been watching the hit HBO series Chernobyl, hmm. which is amazing. It's really good. And that kind of thing happens that that dynamic of like yeah. yeah. the government is acting and and has to be in control of the situation even though they're not and it's an unprecedented thing. Yeah. And so everything that they do, everything that they do is an effort either to cover it up or to absolutely make it seem like they're in control. So I believe that uh, government cover-ups happen more to save ass than to like have a conspiracy to keep information from being public. They they don't want information to, from to be public, but I think that has more to do with the sort of um, you know the way that like people at that high level are like they're playing an essentially political game. Right. So information control is important and it can help you with you and your faction. And you're trying to wrestle more power away from whatever other groups you're in competition with. Especially at the time, like, you know, when we're, we talked about the battle of Los Angeles, the time that that was happening and, you know, today we we're going to be discussing the Kenneth Arnold stuff that happened in 1947 at that time. That was also extremely important, whatever was going on for the government to have control over the, the knowledge that the actual intelligence that was being gathered yeah. because 
you know, the geo, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, geopolitical state of affairs was still being kind of, we were going through this birthing process in, you know, the World War Two, and then 1947, we were still going through that. That was the beginning. Was that not the beginning of like the arms race and, and space race? I mean, uh, yeah, roughly, I, I think. Um, some of these things didn't start at exactly the same time. I'm not sure when Operation Paperclip started. Uh, that would be something to know. Um, we don't have time to go into like the Dulles brothers, but I think they were on the ascendancy, and uh, one of them was like largely responsible for instituting the CIA, for example. I don't think they were around yet, but I think the Military Intelligence Service, whatever it was called, OSS maybe, yeah. I think uh, maybe it was still around. I don't know. Um, there's a lot of details about this period that are super important, but... I just there's don't a, have on the top of my head. There's that colloquial saying, though, that probably goes back centuries, you know, loose lips sink ships. So you want, yeah. to, you want to have a real tight control on, <clears throat> on intelligence. And if something, if something like a UFO that is verifiable, like, <laughs> enters our airspace and we can you know identify or, or at least we get some idea of what's happening we don't want anyone to think that it may be one of our enemies and we mm. also don't you know we especially in on like state side we wouldn't want anyone to think like yeah you know in the battle of los angeles too you can um kind of understand why you know this is war like you want everyone to think that something was up there, but you don't want anyone to think that you're being invaded. So literally the only way is to have some kind of benign craft like a weather balloon, you know? Maybe there was a Japanese plane or something, but if there was, uh, I mean, the other thing is like, if you're the U.S. military, you're not getting out of an embarrassing situation, so you have to pick the least embarrassing or at least the one that fulfills whatever the person who gets to choose what they say, what fills their, or like what is aligned with their interests. Um, so. So, so yeah, this is a long roundabout way of saying that I guess I would rather, if I was in the position of the military, have people think that it was a, a flying saucer for a number of reasons. Then, mm. you know, especially like I would rather, if I was in the position of the military in, in 1947, I would rather than anyone and the years like subsequent to that, like I would rather anyone think it was like little green men, uh, re, you know, rather than the Russians or, what well, what about like this that? idea of like um I think it's called uh fire hosing maybe that thing that um Vladimir Putin does where he uh, tells a lie so transparent that you know everybody knows it's a lie but the fact that you can't challenge him on it means that he is in total control of the situation and yeah. there is a sort of psychological effect there um I mean, it gets almost to this place where it's like... You start to believe the lie? Well, like, the the truth itself as a concept has no power here. It is almost... Oh, yeah. Like, you're more powerful than reality itself. Um, other, you know, there have been some very some specific U.S. politicians who have attempted to take advantage of uh, this as well. In recent history, uh, maybe? In pretty maybe. recent history, yeah. Um, some of them have more been more successful at it than others. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, the military claiming that it's a, a bird when it's clearly not a bird, you know, in, in a lot of times I think people, like, I feel like I'm pretty reasonable about this stuff. So, but some of it's like, dude, it really wasn't a bird though. <laughs> it super wasn't a bird, yeah. whatever it was, <laughs> but they're just like, it was a bird. Stop asking questions. <laughs> and it's almost like, oh, shit 
Maybe they do know what's going on. Maybe they do have a handle on this. Because if they're like, it's a bird and shut the fuck up, then I'm going to be like, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> at least somebody knows what's going on. You know. What is that meme that's been going around for a couple of years that birds aren't real? They're, uh, they're actually government drones. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not familiar with that meme, I guess. I just thought I'd throw in some pop culture real quick. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it doesn't make <laughs> us seem very old or anything. <laughs> You're, you're like, hello, fellow kids. I, I know about that meme. Okay, so um, what, what brings us here today? Uh, well, the power of friendship brings us here today, but uh, what I wanted to talk about today was about um, Kenneth Arnold. And in fact, I did something that I have sworn I would never do, which is that I made a bit of a script and... Um, it's very painful for me to say this, but, and so I've titled it <clears throat> notes on Kenneth Arnold or what the fuck was going on during June and July of 1947. And in fact, it wasn't just June, July of 1947. It was even more specific than that. It was late June, early July of 1947. <laughs> um, a lot of, uh, um, a lot of UFO shenanigans are going on during this time, and it's important to talk about. So, if the, I'll just start reading what I wrote. If the Battle of Los Angeles is a kind of proto-myth or precursor to modern American UFO folklore, then the Kenneth Arnold UFO incident is when it all began in earnest. This incident is crucial and developed many of the concepts that are common to those of us in the UFO, UFO world today. Um, I feel like scripting is actually necessary so that I can communicate some of the important elements of this because a lot of things appear for the first time in this story and keep appearing forever. So um, uh, I guess before we get into that, I should uh, add a couple of caveats. Uh, one, everyone has heard different versions of these stories. This is a common thing that happens in like folk tales. Mm -hmm. We, uh, and this kind of ties into a larger issue with, I have on focusing on the, uh, fact or fiction part of this, um, Skylar, um, it would be fair to say that you and I are not scientists, right? I think that you could say that. In fact, not. we're not really experts in anything. <laughs> Hey, we're just two uh, guys that have some microphones and wanted to talk about weird shit that's going on, right? Is that reasonable, you think? That's reasonable, yeah. Okay, so if you've come here for is this real or not, you have come to the wrong place. There, <laughs> <laughs> there are a thousand different things. Like, you, you can go almost anywhere else to get... Um, you know, people with knowledge about these things. We're just like telling ghost stories that's and speculating wildly about this stuff because we think it's interesting and or funny. Um, it'll and it'll be way more fun to do that too. So just, so. yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that said, you know, I, um, so Skylar and I have a bit of, um, I don't, think I'd even call it a disagreement. Um, we have different perspectives on what value does truth have in this conversation. So I am of the opinion that, you know, truth obviously is an important part of the tension in UFO and other supernatural paranormal type of type stories. It's, um, uh, I mean, it's just built in, you know, that's part of it. It could have really happened is like a fundamental reason yeah. why these things are interesting. But it's not the only reason that I think they're interesting. Yeah. And I like to talk about all of it. I don't like the conversation to end there. Because if they aren't, if these stories are not true, if everybody was either lying or something weird was going on with them mentally, um, that's still fucking fascinating. It is, and it's still the the idea that we're having these conversations as, as a species and as a culture... Yeah, I think is interesting because even if the thing that we're looking into didn't happen, like you've said so many times, something happened because yeah, it had to have <laughs> on um on the 
Wikipedia page for Men in Black, not the which we're gonna talk about a little bit later. <clears throat> not the uh, you know, not the you know, not the Will Smith <laughs> film. The uh, um, but the phenomenon. I, I guess love all. Men in Black, though. It's really fascinating, and we're absolutely going to have to talk about it. We're gonna touch on it a little bit today, like I said, but we are gonna have to get into it. On that Wikipedia page, though, an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about is um, there's a uh, note, uh, like a, a site or um, a reference to something that an expert in folklore was talking about where uh, he traces the origins and some of his work back to um, appearances of Lucifer in earlier times. And it's like he's arguing that this is an updated or modern version of those kinds of events. And a, and a lot of literary um, or in a lot of narratives, they symbolize things like trauma, which the men in black most certainly do. Well, I just want to mention aside here, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but there is some American folklore about the devil. Yes. Appearing to yes. say Robert Johnson. Yeah. As a man dressed in black. There are a lot of stories about that. There are uh, other um, other attempts to update this. I say attempts like it's something being done intentionally. But like uh, what's the um, something cold? Oh, was, injury to cold. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, these are other kinds of examples where it's sort of been modernized in a way. But uh, we'll probably get into that at a future point. I just wanted to use an example of something where an expert is doing the thing that I'm talking about, even though I'm not an expert like that in any way. Yeah. I'm just an asshole. <laughs> I'm just drinking beer and talking about UFO stories. That is, <laughs> that's all this is. So you're making us sound like rednecks, man. Well, I mean, <laughs> um, that's not inherently a bad thing, by the way, to be a I redneck. Didn't, I didn't say that. I know they, you didn't. I'm just saying conversations over sure. a cold can of Bush. Uh, let's see, um, skipping part of this. Okay. Yeah. So I'll pick back up with that. UFO encounters have this sort of, uh, mythological quality where they're kind of outside of science in the same way that something like, um, uh, studying gods are They're They're like supernatural in a literal sense. But since we do live in a scientific era, like I said before, the idea that we're seeking the truth of these encounters is a foundational component to the larger UFO community, even if I have misgivings about that idea and its utility. Um, it is an inherent part that makes them fascinating. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm skipping different parts of this that... Uh, these are you're still on your right. caveats, yeah. Um, we're yeah, that's the end of that. We're moving beyond this now. Um, okay, yeah. So, so how do we how do we talk about these things where we kind of acknowledge that the truth is a part of this, but not the central component of it? Um, you know, how do you can basically. How do you compare and contrast different UFO stories? Well, I want to mention mm -hmm. this may have been one of your caveats. I may just be reiterating what you what you said, but I think there's a misconception about fact versus fiction that like there is some ultimate truth and I'm not trying to like take away from empirical, you know, study or like the scientific method, but you know, the, the, the whole, it's all approximation. And I know that that's a specific kind of like when you're talking about doing scientific research, that's really a specific term, but you're always approximating the truth. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. That's why we talk about uh standards of, um, or not standards of, um, it's, uh, you know, the alpha symbol when you're doing statistics, it's, you're trying to get as close to as, true as possible you can say with like 95 percent certainty that something is true but right and so these things that whether they are physical like manifestations or not like it like everything that's uh, that is unknown 
to this point is going to seem like magic. So we're really ascribing like, or we're really like projecting our understanding of what we know to be quote true onto these things that we don't have language for yet. Yeah. Well, and the fantastical stories have been, uh, you know, they've been inspiration for generations of people, you know, forever. Like, uh, and part of it that I skipped a few minutes ago, I was going to like, I was uh, going to, and then decided not to. And I guess I decided to do this again. Um, I, these kinds of things are what got me interested in science in the first place in a similar way that trying like, to know the unknowable. Yeah. Like or, previous generations would, um, you know, want to discover or yeah, discover like the divine nature of God's creation or whatever. And so, they get inspiration from their religious beliefs, et cetera. And yeah, I mean, this stuff, it's all part of, it's all, I, I feel like a lot of this is very useful and UFOs and these kinds of phenomena are becoming like, uh, there's a modern pantheon of folklore that we draw upon now. And I think it's important to recognize that and enjoy that for what it is. Sorry, I threw you off of, what you were saying, though, I think you were um, touching on something else. Oh yeah. So, one thing I want us to be thinking about while we're going over a lot of these stories now in the future is um, what I'm going to call a credibility economy. This is how we can compare different stories to each other. So, for an example, like. Um, a, a second or third hand piece of information given to you by one source is not valuable. An eyewitness account is not scientifically valuable, but in UFO world, this is, you know, maybe it's like a, a nickel or something. No, probably more than that. It's like a dollar or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's not super valuable, but it's useful. Multiple eyewitnesses is more valuable having um a military eyewitness is valuable it's it's worth more than just a normal eyewitness um having let's see what are some others uh photographs are valuable a video is more valuable than a photograph mm -hmm. um yeah it so yeah there are different different tiers to this but um Let's see, I'm trying to catch Hang up. On. Did I? I didn't do that. No, oh, no, okay. you're good, dude. Okay, just making sure. Yeah. Um, is credibility a good approximation of truth truthiness? <laughs> no, it it's not, and never never Wait, think did you that say again. Credibility? Yes, is credibility an approximator for truthiness? No, oh, it yeah. is not. Okay. Never think that again, Skyler. Well, I I wasn't thinking it. I was just making sure. I'm sorry. I will never think that again. <laughs> Thank you. But is it basically the only way that we can compare and contrast certain elements of these stories that come up, up over and over again? Yes, Skylar, it is. Thanks. Yeah. And this is why I took you home from the orphanage and not your brother. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, the Kenneth Arnold UFO incident is... Um, Wait, can I just interrupt you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Don't hate me. You, you don't have to apologize. Just interrupt me. Don't apologize okay. Okay. for interrupting me. Okay. <clears throat> um, you mentioned Indrid Cold earlier. I, I, yeah. I wanted to just say that that is one of those. Um, there was an, a, a single eyewitness to the initial encounter and then multiple eyewitnesses unrelated to the initial encounter. You're talking about injured cold. Injured cold. We we can do a separate that that whole situation with him and the Mothman and all of that is fascinating enough as it is. So we should probably talk about that at a different time, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. it's really interesting though. We are we absolutely are going to talk about that. I think. Um, the uh, <clears throat> the Kenneth Arnold UFO incident is, I think, uh, I it's like. 
I actually think it's tied in together with some stuff that was going on in June and July of 1947. So on the on the day of <clears throat> Kenneth Arnold, which um, it, there's some strange stuff that's going on in the story. So one of the strange things is he's a private pilot, <clears throat> which on the scale, uh, pilots, I think, are seen as more credible than just your average Joe. But... I think a military pilot would be better, but the military is related because on his way to a business trip as a private flyer, he took a detour because he heard about a missing military aircraft that they had, like they had a reward out for. So he took a detour to go find it. That's really weird, right? Am I the only one who thinks that's really weird? I think it's weird. Well, I have to ask, though, when we were discussing this last week, was I wrong about the fact that he or that I thought that he was a former military pilot? He was always private. He was never addressed in the stuff that I read as a military person. Okay, that is that is odd. But I mean, you would you would think that like somebody who has credentials to be a pilot would. Maybe if they're out in the area, the the military would be like... Well, that's... But it's like... Number one, is this something that happens a lot? Is it something that happened a lot back then but doesn't happen anymore? Like, I'd like a little bit more information. Not a lot of information about this, but I'd like a little bit more information about this downed aircraft. We know what it is. It's um, uh, it's a C-46 transport plane. Right, right. Um, it's just really weird. So, so maybe, maybe he just happened to be the guy that was out there at the time, or did he do, do this on his own? Was he, he did not- this on his own. They put out a reward for it, which oh, okay. it's like, where do you even go to find uh, rewards for that kind of stuff? They didn't have the internet. I guess your closest air force base. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. it just seems like there's something like we skipped a step somewhere, you know? Right. So anyway, this is how the story goes. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, I should back up and say very specifically, this is on June 24th, 1947, okay? So this whole thing... So is this when he's looking for the aircraft is when the incident yes. ha- occurs, okay? So this is um, on June 24th, 1947, and he's flying near Mount Rainier in Washington, and he was trying to find the C-46 transport plane to get a reward for its recovery. Now, mind you, the reward was $5,000, which is about $60,000 in U.S. currency today. So why wouldn't the military just be doing that recovery? This is exactly what I'm talking about. I'd like just a little bit more information about this. Hmm. Um, uh, so... While he was out and about sky cruising, he, at some point, and I think you know a little bit more detail about this, but the punchline is he saw nine aircraft flying in a formation. Yeah. Uh, When he was discussing this with the, well, actually, I should back up. He saw a flash of light, and then within 30 seconds later, he saw nine separate aircraft. Uh, He did like a rough kind of mental calculation to figure out how fast they were going by using two points in the background. He knew the distance between those points and he thought that they were going at about 1200 miles per hour. Um, there were some later revisions Which done to the estimate faster than anything at that time could fly. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to, yeah. So they later did some revisions to this number. Who are they? I don't know, but they thought it was closer to like 1650 miles per hour even if we go with the lowest estimate, you're talking two to two and a half times as fast as anything could go back then. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, later, and, and he said that they looked like boomerang or like delta shaped, like a, like a cross between a delta and a triangle. Um, when the news asked him how did they move, he said they moved as if you were... You were skipping a saucer across a river. And from this, the news got a headline. And from that headline, the idea of the flying saucer was born. 
uh, you know, never mind that in fact he had said that the crafts were shaped again like boomerangs. Um, you got something to say, Skylar? You good? Yeah, yeah. I was just <clears throat> sorry. I'm just trying to catch up with the. I'm kind of skipping around, so skipping around. you don't okay. have to hold to it too much. It's just like um, like yeah, like a document with some information on it. So. I want to emphasize this is the first time that a pilot or anyone post World War II had claimed to see a flying aircraft, you know, an, an, a UFO in the, yeah. a, if you will, a UFO, a UFO. Yeah. Um, in the in the sky. And um, Mr. Arnold, though, was not the only person to have seen that incident. And, and in fact, uh, all told, there would be 16 separate corroborations of this. The unfortunate part is a lot of them are super unclear. Some of them are like, you know, maybe it was that day, but I remember it being like rainy. You know what I mean? Like yeah. where the stories don't quite add up, but there were two that are significant because they can be traced to the exact date and time and they had other information that makes it seem like it was the same incident. So right. <clears throat> one of them was a prospector who saw six craft, but they were bobbing sort of the way that he had described them. Uh, Mr. Earl had described them. And then there was a guy on fire watch duty in a tower mm -hmm. um, who saw the bright flash of light. And then he saw, I think he said he saw nine, but they were all shooting in a straight direction. So there's some weirdness, right? There's some strangeness here because they have elements, pieces that contradict the original story. But it, it's like, I mean, if they were like bandwagoning or grifting, you would just lie, right? You would just yeah. have the exact same details. And yeah, but you know, that fact aside, it's, um, it's just a little strange. Um, so, so what, oh, <clears throat> what is it exactly that Kenneth Arnold described? Um, or do you want me to do my, in broad strokes, it was just the stuff I said. If you wanted to go more in detail, you're welcome to. Well, I just was, I was thinking like, so you said there are 16 different, accounts of this so yeah but some of them are like sketchy and probably are just grifters or whatever but the the details as i remember from reading about it was that it was clear a clear day it was yeah and sunny and that he the the thing where i was making i made up a person who said it was raining i'm just saying oh, yeah. like a lot of them had those kinds of details where it was like this doesn't and or they were like and also it was like May, you know what I mean? Like yeah. they were just like stuff didn't ran, didn't work. And those two other stories are the only ones where it's very clear. This was the same thing. So what, what do we know about the perceived size of the craft? I don't know. Do you know? I mean, I, if that's I something that's if, been unclear to me, if I recall, Kenneth Arnold described them as much larger than his plane. And I can't remember what kind of plane he was flying, but it was not a... I looked at a picture of it. It's not enormous. It's it's enclosed. You know, yeah. it's it's like a sky car. Yeah. Like, yeah. And he, I believe he described them as larger than his craft by a, you know, by a bit. Um, and then the way he described them as moving, which this is an interesting thing, is that I've never really heard of a... UFO incident where they were moving quite in that same way. Yeah. You hear about like the like aerial acrobatics that these objects do. Sure. Right angles, blasting off in impossible speeds. Right. But these seemed to be kind of like cruising. Just chilling. And and then moving in a way like again the the way the reason that flying saucer became like the colloquial term for UFOs was because Kenneth Arnold described them as as bobbing up and down like somebody had like skipped a saucer plate across a body of water. We, but that's uh, 
that's weird in and of itself because why wouldn't do, do people skip saucers? I've only ever heard of skipping well, stones. Mean, yeah, skipping stones. Why I, wouldn't you say a stone then? What has he skipped saucers across? Perhaps. Like if it wasn't saucer shaped, why did he say that? That's that is curious. Just say it's shaped like a delta, but it moved like you're skipping a stone across the river. It's it, see, it's little details like this, and we've I've got more too that are just a little <laughs> weird, like yeah. a little weird, not uh, not real weird. It's not like you heard a jackal and walked outside and you saw a a dog with a with a deer's head and it was giggling like a little girl, like not like Skinwalker Ranch weird. Yeah. That's some weird <laughs> shit. You know, yeah. it's but this stuff is well, just a little weird. But you got to think like when it when it is just an eyewitness, like they're going again. We keep talking about this. They're going to use the terminology that they, the, the language that they know. So, so maybe in, you know about skipping a saucer across a river. You have heard of skipping stones across a river. That would be your go to thing, right? But maybe it didn't quite look like that. And maybe Kenneth Arnold liked to. You know, has he ever seen a saucer be skipped across a I river? Don't know. What I'm saying is like maybe when he was a kid, like one of the things that he and his family did was like they'd like skip their saucer plates and just lose them. your dinnerware. Well, maybe that maybe it was like a thing where he'd like go out and swim and get them and bring them back, and mom would be like, "Yay!" Maybe it was, but I feel like you we should we <laughs> get to have that information now. If you say <laughs> this yeah. is this is. Well, I, I want to okay. say it again. This is where the term flying saucer came from. Okay, okay. This is this is a thing that is so in it's so etched deep inside us. <laughs> it's as deep as the shape of the McDonald's logo. Yeah. It's buried deep. And this is where it fucking came from. Well, well let's see. Let's see. He was skipping saucers. <laughs> That's a little weird. It is a little weird. It's it, a little weird. It's a weird thing to say. It is a little weird to say that. Unless you maybe did that. Yeah. Maybe he liked to get I, drunk at parties and like he'd be like throw people's think. dishes in the river. I mean, that doesn't sound that strange to me. It sounds a little mean. I mean, not, not like really mean, but a little mean. Maybe they were his dishes. I don't know. Maybe it was like a party. Like maybe it was like a thing he did at parties. He's like, Haha, you're skipping stones out here. Watch this. And he like goes out and skips the saucer. And it's like for, you know, however long. Because I mean, they're made of porcelain or China. The, the, or whatever. Well, OK, here's another possibility. Okay. <laughs> Maybe he has skipped so many things across that goddamn river that he knows the difference between, well, that's not what it looks like when you skip a bottle across a river. <laughs> that's not what it looks like. He know he's so specific. He has seen so many things skipped across that river that he knows this is not what it looks like when a stone is skipped across a river. Yeah. It looks nothing like that. Yeah. It looks more like if you <laughs> skip a saucer. Listen, I'm I'm Kenneth Arnold. I I drive a plane and I've skipped a lot of things across rivers. It's a little weird though, it right? It is a little weird, yeah. But that's where that term comes from. Forever now. Yeah. And you wouldn't the craft that he described b being boomerang shaped you would not think that that would be the kind of thing you'd want to skip across a river yeah well why wouldn't he say it was like you skipped a boomerang across a river or you skipped like a triangular stone across like i can think of ten thousand things that makes more sense without additional context it's just a weird thing to think of i think like like fling it's also a weird throwing thing. Throwing a saucer it, across a... You're right, you're right. You're right. It is very strange. Equally as strange to explain every one of these things with... It was just a weather balloon. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, the government later said that this was a mirage, which I actually think this, where he's saying it's like triangular shaped or boomerang shaped, this would have been a perfect time for them to roll out the, dude, you saw a flock of birds. Yeah. You saw a flock of birds. Your plane was rocking up and down. You were the one going like a saucer across a river. <laughs> and it looked like they were because the background is static. Maybe you're at like a specific height or maybe there's something visual going on. I, I, I don't know. I'm not a scientist, again, but 
I can think of a thousand ways that even adding that shred of doubt that it was a bird thing, it would have been, uh, yeah, it would have been too easy for them to do that. Which is actually the reason why I was thinking about, you know, them like as a, like a power move. Like maybe it's like gaslighting. Like they pick the least possible <laughs> reason and try to sell that to you. Um, <clears throat> so really quick here, I want to, I want to get into this stuff really quick because we're almost at the end of my thing. Um, so the timeline, uh, so like two weeks later, there is this guy who named William Rhodes who, and this is a little weird too. <laughs> he hears a sound outside and he thinks that's a plane. That's a jet plane. I'm going to take a picture of it. That's what he thinks to himself. So this man grabs his camera and goes outside to take a picture of the jet plane. Which in 1947 would probably be a fairly difficult thing to set up. Was this at daytime I don't, or at I don't know. It was, a, it was in daytime. I'm not sure how... To, I think it would have been possible without too much hassle, but I'm just like, why did? what were you going to use that picture for? Like, does he just have a wall and a room in his house? And he's <laughs> like, this is a picture of all my jet planes. <laughs> Or, I'm I mean, sorry, the, it's a wall of pictures. To be fair. Is what it is. To be fair, if you saw a jet flying over your house in 1947, I mean, I see jets yeah, fly over my yeah, house, maybe. and I'm always, like, looking up at them, like, wow, that, That's true, that's but cool. has it ever occurred to you to take a picture of one? Maybe no, it's but because we, we can always take pictures. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. And that's what, that was my point. But this is a thing where it's, like, it's just... It's not nearly as strange as the flying saucers thing, okay? It's definitely but not nearly as strange. But it's a little relatively new technology, excuse me. I mean, but it's a little Within weird. A, not, it's again, it's one of these situations where I would like a little bit more, but not a lot more information about this. Honey, come out here. One of them government jets is flying over again. This is crazy. Yeah, I don't like, know. I mean, but bless his beautiful beautiful brain for wanting to take that <laughs> stupid fucking picture of a jet plane because he got a picture of one of them well i of say one plane? of them he got a picture of a ufo which looks like the drawing that kenneth arnold drew do you, we have this picture well i'm not gonna show the picture to you right now because this is an audio format I want to see the picture. <laughs> well, you can look it up if you want. Damn it. But he, uh, we'll, we'll look at it in a minute, okay? okay? Okay, okay. We can take a break in a minute. I'll show it to you. But it looks a lot like the drawing of Kenneth Arnold's UFO. Um, although, I, let's be real, Kenneth Arnold's drawing looks a little, a little basic. <laughs> a little basic. But, and. Speaking of which, he said, like, Delta, like, this, okay, this guy is so fucking weird, okay? He talks about how they move as, like, flinging a saucer, I say flinging, throwing it, skipping a saucer across a river, and then he said, this shit looks like Delta's, but the picture William Rhodes took is, like, a tadpole. It, that's what my brain jumped to immediately. Oh, yeah, you've I do seen know this it. Picture. Okay. Yeah. So it looks like a tadpole, but um, a you sperm? know, of course, it may not be. Yeah, like a sperm. <laughs> it may not be the same craft, of course, but he does take a picture of it, and then he sends it off to the newspapers, who decide to print it. In the meantime, in the meantime, I think it's like the day in between. Um, Roswell happens, and then immediately after, two people claiming to be government agents, one of them's name was Lieutenant Colonel Bean, and then the other claimed to be an FBI agent, and they demanded the negatives from him. They took them and left. They were wearing uh, nice black suits, by the way, so, you know. So th this is either a precursor case or the first case of men in black sighting. Ooh. Ooh. Um, and so they took the negatives off. And of course, later when he tr contacted the military and the FBI, they had, quote, no knowledge of the. Yeah. Of so it bears mentioning as Positive a site. Yeah. 
It bears mentioning as a side note real quick that um, before this happened to Mr. Rhodes, it in like like three days before Kenneth Arnold's incident, like June 21st of 1947, uh, there was a case claimed to involve the men in black by Her- Harold Dahl and uh, somebody else. It was called the, the Mari Island UFO incident or something. Um, this has largely been discredited, or at least it, it seems like there's not a lot of energy, not a lot of people think there's anything to this. So, um, you know, I'll leave it up to you. If you want to, uh, look into it, just Google Mari Island UFO incident or something like that. But, um, so that, you know, if there was any legitimacy to that, that might be the first case of men in black, but. This is the first case that I'm aware of, and then I think the Men in Black stories begin truly in earnest with Albert K. Bender in the 50s, so a little bit later on. But anyway, be that as it may. So they took his negatives, and then um, let's just keep score here. They had nine craft when Kenneth Arnold saw them. And then in this is in New Mexico where William road sees it or no it's arizona it's 400 miles away from roswell is where he sees this thing he takes the picture it's a single one and then i think it's july 12th it's not very yeah on july 12th 1947 a tulsa oklahoma newspaper called the daily world printed a nighttime photo of eight UFOs in the shape of triangles flying by. And you can look up that photograph. So if we do the math, what? you know, Kenneth Arnold sees nine. One crashes in Roswell. That They go from Oregon down to Arizona and start moving east. Something happened they, in Arizona. Something happened in, well, New Mexico. And then... And then they are exiting Tulsa, Oklahoma a few days later, but there's only eight. Hmm. Is that plausible? I, I don't fucking know, but it, it like they seem like they'd be related, so right? The, they so happen so quick. The photo in Tulsa happened after Roswell or right it before? Was the, it was the very last thing to have happened, I think. So do, the day do, after. Do, what was the date of Roswell? Let's just look that I up I thought quick. it was like July 8th. Yeah, so this happened July 12th. Okay. Is when the Tulsa thing happened. Hmm. Um, God bless our researchers for really diving into this because I'm finding out new stuff about this that I did not know. Just says July. What was the date? Come on. July 8th. You were, yeah, you were right. So, yeah. So the last thing to have happened in the timeline is the Tulsa thing. The 10 day period that we're talking about. Was it 10 days? Ish. It was from June 24th to July 12th is the last thing that may have been related that our researchers were, were able to find. Um, and they did a good job, uh, especially considering the rations they've been on. Well, that's amazing. I actually did not know the about the Tulsa photograph at all. It's on the Wikipedia page for uh, Kenneth Arnold. Um, Why have I never heard about these things being connected? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if they were drawing that. Con- it just seems like an obvious connection to make. You know, it does. Um, there are like some smaller incidents that happened during those. Uh, what is it? 18 days or so. Um, that I just didn't feel like were I mean, I've super heard, interesting. I've heard about the Kenneth Arnold Roswell connection. Yeah. But I'd not ever heard about the <clears throat> photograph from Tulsa. Yeah. So the fact that it was in a newspaper is, uh, I mean, who knows? Maybe it was a tabloid. I didn't get to see any research they did on the, I want to say I also, itself. I feel like, and I could be wrong, but like, I feel like a lot of this stuff was happening before, like the real UFO sensationalism took hold. Just like we talked about the Battle of Los Angeles. 
Oh yeah, this stuff started that stuff. Well, that's what I'm saying. Then th- I find that interesting because absolutely, you know, through the '50s and, and the '60s, there were tons of comics, and you know, what like uh, what are what are those periodicals called that are like in, in, in investigating the supernatural, like what John Keel wrote for mm. before mm-hmm. he went to investigate the Mothman, and I think they published some of the stuff like that became the Mothman prophecies, anyways. Like this is all before that stuff was like very. That was yeah. It was before it was very pop culture. There was no so. template for it. This is the first time we see some of this stuff. I feel like as we go on with these stories, we're going to get an idea of some of the templates that they're using. You know. So you mentioned earlier while we we're still talking about Kenneth Arnold. That was there radar verification of the fleet that he saw not in the uh, document that the researchers gave me. I didn't see any radar verification, but I mean, you've got three separate eyewitness accounts that uh, line up pretty solidly. What's curious to me though, is that something like the battle of Los Angeles, which of course it was wartime. It was right after Pearl Harbor could elicit so much hysteria you would think that something like that photograph that was published in what was it the world globe or whatever i don't remember what you said uh the daily world daily world yeah like you would think that that might elicit some sort of well panic. that's the thing roswell did roswell did and yeah. roswell's happening at the same time you, uh, keep in mind, all of this stuff happens very quick. It's less than three weeks from start to finish. Yeah. So uh, Roswell, I think, dominated a lot of that, and we're going to talk about it very soon so about Roswell itself. What was our relationship with the Soviets like at that at, in 1947? Uh, I think it was bad. bad. I think it was real bad. Was that before or after? It may have been around the time the Iron Curtain. I'm not sure when they... I thought it was 46 or 47. So again, like, these new extreme technologies are developing, right? Mm-hmm. Like, for the first time. Yeah. And and you would think that, like, even... Like, if Kenneth Arnold is someone who's going to go look for a military aircraft... So, like, you would think that, like, maybe this this dude that said he saw, I mean, fucking nine unidentified aircraft, like, that, one, the military would take it more seriously, and also that the media would, I mean, obviously it was a huge media spectacle, but that it would be more... I think it would have been if it had not been for Roswell. Because we're talking... Um, but Roswell didn't even elicit the kind of response that the Battle of Los Angeles did from the military. I mean, there was a... Well, not in the moment. I think they learned from the Battle of Los Angeles, which is one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about it oh. the first, because I wanted to establish like a baseline. Like, And <clears throat> in Battle of L.A., you know, there is... The military is the military, but there's a big difference between a wartime and a peacetime military, especially because... But we weren't even in peacetime, right? In 1947? I mean, technically we were, were, but we were dealing with the Soviets. This is the distinction, okay? Mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor happens. Everyone is in panic mode. But also, conscription comes. And conscription, you get a lot of people that don't want to be there. You know that... That that annoying coworker that um, doesn't want to be there. They always are lazy on the job. They don't do any work. When they do do work, they're doing it half assed and hey, just to like. I resemble that. Uh-huh. They're doing it like <laughs> performatively. We all have that coworker because they all make our work even harder, right? Um, yeah. That's what conscripts do in the military. So you're flooding every unit every place with these people that don't want to be there and don't want to do the thing. I mean, a lot of them, you know, probably want to fight for the country. I'm not saying that, um, you know, you just get a different kind of person. Plus 
the U.S. military had not been mobilized like that, and we had not been using any of that technology for very long. There are a lot of different reasons why something goes wrong in February of 1942, you know, that leads to an incident like Battle of Los Angeles. Um, but I bet a lot of people higher up learned a lot of lessons about that. So I'm going to go ahead and wildly speculate here. Was it a C-36? That is the entire point of this. C-36 transport? C-46. C-46 transport plane? What if, Alex, what if the Kenneth Arnold sighting, while he was looking for the C-46, was a rescue mission? What if something had happened? I thought about that too. Oh my God. Like... Why did the C-46 go down? We are never told that. For example. What if there was some event that happened before where there was a, a crash flying saucer? Perhaps, maybe the Battle of Los Angeles, because you're talking about like interstellar terms here, right? Like, And one of the aliens was captured by the military at that time. And then, you know, five years pass, and they send some people to rescue the dude. Oh, that's interesting. So what if we make all UFO stories canon, and they all interconnect? They're in this larger UFO cinematic universe. I think, I I mean... I like it. I like it. We're going to develop that every time, I think. (laughs) So... They, they go to find, like, let, let's say Kenneth Arnold actually finds the down C-36 or C-46. Because you said it was a transport plane, right? I believe. Oh, my God. Yeah. What if they're transporting their buddy? Yeah. And, and so they pick him up. Maybe they pick him up and that's the flash of light that Kenneth Arnold sees. Yeah. They're all taking off again. And they're out of there. And Kenneth just happens to catch them while they're on their way out. So maybe, what, does one get lost several days later and then we shoot it down in New Mexico? Maybe. Maybe (laughs) they're transporting one of those craft or transporting their buddy that was lost here. And that's the one we know to go after and shoot it down. And they're like, oh, shit, like, lost cause. We got to get the fuck out because, you know. I mean... You know, again, we're speculating wildly, but what's the alternative here? Well, the, they... if if the events are not related, we have to start bringing in a bunch of psychological stuff. Um, you know, some kind of mania or hysteria or which are always very fluid uh, pseudoscientific terms, you know. They've had different different definitions at different times. Nobody really knows what what it is, you know. Um, there definitely seems to be some kinds of hysteria that have been recorded. Are you familiar with the dancing plague? Um, and the Salem if, witch trials. Salem witch, witch trials, although there's been some evidence that that may have been caused by essentially like hallucinogenic drugs. Yeah. But um, you mean just in the dancing hysteria. plague, if you don't know... Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it um, it was uh, maybe in the Holy Roman Empire or France or something. In, in Europe, there was um, a situation where somebody started dancing uncontrollably in the middle of town, and then people started joining them, that and they danced awesome, for... The way. Well, it was horrible, because they danced for like a month, and they seemed like they were exhausted and they wanted to stop. They had terror in their eyes and a bunch of them died from dehydration that or sounds like starvation. The, the perfect rock show for me. Sounds terrifying to me. <laughs> Does make me think of the Mexican dancing skeletons for the holiday. I can't pronounce, <clears throat> but yeah. So I like to connect it in my mind, late June to early July of 1947. Cause there seems to be some potentially related shenaniganry afoot. Okay, so are we ready to talk about Roswell? Can we do that? 
I'd like to study it more before we get truly into it. If you'd like to introduce it, be my guest. I'd like to... So this is my plan for Roswell. I'd like to... uh, Because we need to... Similar similar to this where I scripted bits of it or at least made notes, I'm going to want to probably make notes for this again because Roswell's a big one, right? Right. Um, And we're going to have to try to get to an angle that uh, maybe other people haven't discussed because otherwise what's the point yeah but either way i'd like to do some reading but if you would like to talk about it please i was just thinking that <clears throat> the the idea that these are connected and maybe there is more to it and that we're speculating about like maybe this being a rescue mission gone wrong which i think there is precedent for in the human experience. Yeah. Uh, Well, the human experience is exactly why I wanted to talk about these things. So, yeah, I mean, it could be the very fact that we're like connecting these dots in this way. It's like, I mean this we're engaging in like a form of storytelling by connecting these things, right? This is an example of the way that folklore develops. Mm. You got a big goofy smile on your face and I love it. (laughs) Just, I just really like it. I I don't think I've <clears throat> thought yeah. about it in these terms before, but yeah. I never have either. It's um it's it's interesting to look at it through this lens. I actually, you know, it's kind of like um it's a mythology I can get behind, right? The strange and unexplained and uh yeah. There's obviously some weird stuff going on. I don't know what it is that's happening. I don't know that I feel comfortable saying it's aliens, but it's definitely something really weird. Maybe it's, uh, I mean, you know, the old classic government experiments or whatever. Maybe um, maybe it was the government working on some stuff to fight the Soviets, and they're worried that it'll get in Soviet hands. That's another thing we didn't talk about earlier about information control. The Cold War is going on, and so... That's yeah. at the height of paranorma, paranorma, paranormia, paranormia. What the fuck is wrong with me? <laughs> I like paranorma and paranormia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those Paranoia <laughs> and paranormal <laughs> things going on. These are, these are, these, those terms that you, words you just came up with, they should, we should work those into our lexicon. What yeah. is, what is paranorma? Uh, paranorma is when you have two normas. <laughs> and what is paranormia? It's, uh, let's see, paranormia. It's the, uh, be it's d- the paranormal experience brought on by paranoia, paranora, paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> I swear I am a very articulate person until I get in front of this microphone. <laughs> Or at least I like to think I am. Um, I think you're working on new stuff now, man. There's you're, you're uh, on the yeah. cutting edge of <laughs> of language. <laughs> language. <laughs> um, a paranormia is when you mix paranoia with the paranormal. Yeah, people do that. Yeah, I like. I'd like to not do that as much as I do. Well, and I think a lot of the stuff does stem from Cold War era anxieties not always the cold war specifically but we have to remember always that there's a backdrop of i I can't remember when the soviets got the bomb like we knew they had it i think it may have been 48 but we knew this stuff is out there now atomic Mm -hmm. destruction is a real thing and soon everyone in the world will be at threat of Uh, it so we touched on this Last time, and you told me to hold the phone on it. The well, now you can make that call. The <laughs> the uh, the idea that if we're going to assume or, or or presume that aliens are visiting us, why would they be doing that? And I I've always connected these two things. You know the the dropping of the bomb in 1945 and what happened in 47 before I ever really knew anything about Kenneth Arnold. And certainly before you enlightened me today about the photographs from Arizona and 
Well, we talked about that a little bit last time. It's like uh, in Star Trek where the Vulcans see us, uh, Zephyr and Cochran, using the warp Warp drive drive, for the first time, and they come over to have a chat, you know? Yeah. So I think it would make more sense for the this whole like late June, early July thing to have happened when it did again, because a response to even interstellar travel at their speed would take maybe two years or so to get here. Right. I'm cu- Yeah. I'm curious though, if there was an alien civilization on, on the nearest earth like planet, which is what we're going to assume. Right. Because if they, fly in things like we do and act like we they, do. they can't fly in things like we do and get here in two years well you know you know what i mean yeah there it's an enclosed craft a spacecraft yeah. or something like <clears throat> can would w- if if there was a civilization on another planet looking at us would they be able to to detect some type of signature from an atomic blast well we can detect chemical signatures and atmospheres of other worlds, or at least we're very close to being able to do that. In fact, that's one of the next things to come on deck at SETI is that they're going to be able to detect things like um, if there were no trees here, there would be 20% less oxygen or something. Um, And the fact that there are so many other living creatures means that there are certain chemicals in the atmosphere that wouldn't be here otherwise. All the methane. Yeah, that was the one that came to my mind as well. So uh, they can detect signatures like that in other atmospheres at a distance. Um, it's a little weird because, I mean, again, we're speculating wildly, so I guess we have to assume some stuff, like whatever allows them to... Uh, let's say it's warp drive. They've got to have some kind of information transfer system that happens almost immediately, you know? Mm. Um, Cause the bigger the delay, the like you have to think that if it took them a year to get the information, then it only took them a year to get here. So it's a little, you know, it's a little funky, but um, uh, let's say it's instantaneous and then it takes them two years to get here or whatever. Um, uh it, I I think if I were an alien species visiting us in <clears throat> 1947, I would think, because the reason we're visiting, again, it's like the Vulcans, we want to come and have a chat with you because now you have a technology that um, could be very disruptive to us in some right. way. Because if you are in a living you know, maybe bullets, maybe they have something to stop bullets, but an atomic blast, that's, that's like some extra, you know, it's just, it's, it's like the kids say it's extra, right? Yeah. Um, (laughs) and so they want to come and talk to us, but then they see that we are, so that they see that, first of all, we don't have space travel and maybe they think, wow, we were much more advanced with certain things before we figured out how to split an atom and make it into a detonation. I guess they're on a different um, like tech tree than we are. They can't leave their stupid planet with their ugly-ass blue sky. <laughs> so we're probably good. We can report back to you know, base and say, we can just leave it alone. They're not going anywhere for a while because what they were maybe thinking is, wow, if they have the atomic bomb, maybe they have, you know, a way to like, can they get to us is basically their, you know, yeah. and then we shoot one of the some bitches down <laughs> because we think it's a Soviet new weapon and we are fucking terrified so in the night in New Mexico, we shoot one down. And now they think, holy shit, <laughs> these fucks are so warlike. You know, we don't want to communicate with them. If the people back on our planet knew what had happened here, there would be an incident. You know, they would want to they would want us to go, you know, m- maybe it's and it's not even like mercy. It's just like their command structure is like. Jesus Christ, we don't want to deal with these apes. So they 
they leave and maybe, you know, they come back every so often to visit us or something. Who knows? You know, I mean, we can construct thousands of scenarios, but that's one possible one. And there's no way to do it without projecting ourselves onto them, which I love that. I mean, vice versa, though, right? Well, yeah, but we don't have any examples of alien species, so... If they're studying us, they're, they have an advantage because they have at least one other example. So what about the idea that, that they've been here the whole time? And I mean, it's as likely as... You know. Yeah, I know, but I'm I'm just saying like alternatively, like maybe that's why we're seeing these things. Because because I, I mean interstellar travel is like very unlikely, right? The older I get, the more I think that there are some great filters out there that we are not aware of yeah. that that like naturally select out life forms. There's something in the universe that is inherently hostile. And a big reason I think of that, or I think that way, is because of the Fermi paradox. Most of the explanations around the Fermi paradox are not what I would call very compelling. And we're just left in this, you know, if we were in their position, if we had, was it a type two or type three where they take over the galaxy, or basically. Even we are emitting text signatures. Yeah. Um, it would be hard to find them, but once we start building solar panels in the in space, um, we've it's already, <clears throat> we've already been doing that. But. Yeah. Well, I mean, a Dyson swarm. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah once we okay. start building shit like that, we're gonna be. It's gonna be a lighthouse. Um, we. Uh, and it okay. We haven't been able to search a lot of the night sky, so, you know, but it just, um, it, it's like, it gnaws at me sometimes and I wonder about it and it, it, it's part of the bizarreness of everything that we don't, I mean, we don't see a galaxy conquering species out there. We don't see something, uh, a super AI that, you know, their race went through a singularity long ago and now it's just trying to build paper clips forever and all the resources in the universe are just for his paper clip making machine. And we don't see that out there. You know, we, we don't, there's nothing like that. So the more you think about it, the more you think that we're here alone. Yeah, but that can't be it. <laughs> I mean, it can't be. So... We gotta keep looking. the The good news, if we're wanting to not be alone, is that there just haven't been, we just haven't been able to search enough of the sky yet, is what astronomers say. So, well, we're getting close to that. I think. I don't think so. You don't? Well, not in the way that you would have to do like a SETI thing. Oh. Like as far as like mapping, sure. But if you're looking for an alien species, it's a different process or so i'm told because you you have to like look at it and and even a lot of the time you know like the the big hubbub with tabby star a couple of years ago it came from data a data package that they put together like five years after the data had come in because it took that long to get funding to have a human go look at it and you know so <laughs> So we could, yeah, it's not very well funded. So if we, <laughs> if we could have like, I mean, the, maybe we've already found it and it's just, somebody hasn't been able to look at the piece of printer paper Damn. and you've got other things too. Although like, you know, the wow signal and a lot of these other signals that come in sometimes, um, almost always they turn out to be terrestrial in origin. Yeah. Uh, there was that one that came in recently yeah. from Alpha Centauri. Yeah, Actually, they, they found out that it probably came from behind Alpha Centauri mm -hmm. if it didn't come from Earth. And that's the other thing. It's so complicated. It's like it either came from this thing that's uh, behind the thing that's four light years away or it came from like your town over. <laughs> 
So what about the, <clears throat> I mean, I know we're just going down the rabbit hole now, but what about the idea that they're not from another planet, but they're interdimensional or something, you know? I mean, sure. I would imagine an interdimensional being would be uh, like not of this, but that's, I'm like used to thinking of dimensions in like mathematical or physics terms rather than. I guess they do have the version where you're different universes or whatever is part of a multiverse, but then it's like, how would you get into the next universe? I guess anything's possible. I don't fucking know. I just think of it like in terms of, and you know, I'm not as versed in this as you are, but that maybe the reason that these things seem so otherworldly mm-hmm. and heavy air quotes that, Maybe it's because they're not of our universe. It would definitely exp- would definitely explain some of like the high strangeness, you know, like maybe that's a ripple effect or some residue. Like the machine that gets you here also would, makes some then, bizarre stuff happen. What would be the purpose if they didn't live in the same universe that we do? What would be the purpose in them coming here unless it was an accident? And that's that's honestly the, my theory. The it theory could be that an I accident. Like, the most is I that do like that. Yeah, they're fucking around. I, I and yeah, exactly. That's why I, I feel like the explanations to these things. It's like a version of Occam's razor. Maybe it's like Alex's razor is. You should always wow, Alex's razor. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I don't use razors. <laughs> okay, uh, I use a double sided broadsword <laughs> when I need to shave. <laughs> So, um, I, so Alex's double-sided broadsword is that, uh, the explanation is always much less interesting than you think it is. Or it's just a fuck up. Well, that's what I mean. It's always Mm. mundane Mm. or an accident. Arbitrary. Arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah. It's never something by design it's never you're never going to get a fun explanation where it's like Dang the government it. covered up this thing because they're like trying to go to war with these aliens in secret and maybe you get this you start this romance with a three-titted alien woman <laughs> like it's never going to be that interesting it's yeah. always going to be some scientists popped into this dimension by mistake because they built a Douglas Adams style improbability machine. And so the least probable things become the most likely things to happen. (laughs) And so an entire small dimension pops into existence next to you. The scientist looks at you, says, Oh shit. Then he transfer transforms into a ham sandwich. (laughs) And then you eat that ham sandwich and forget the whole thing happened. (laughs) Like it's, it's, you know, it's going to be that, or yeah, somebody, I don't know. Somebody just made a mistake. Um, it's going to be a lot of those kinds of things, but never, never anything interesting. Uh, alongside that, I want to, I feel like, um, it's probably a good time to mention this. So I've been holding off on it, but related to interdimensional beings, I don't know if you've ever had this, but, um, I've had friends that have taken some very hardcore psychedelic drugs and I don't do drugs. I know you don't. My friends have told me that in some of them, like in DMT trips, um, they'll have these experiences where interdimensional question mark beings will come and speak to them and be like with angel voices. They'll look like elves kind of, but like bizarre elves but they'll they'll say like oh my god we're so glad you finally come you can finally speak to us your mind is on a frequency that ours is now and then they're like so happy to see you and then when the trip starts to end they're so sad to see you go and then this is a comment my friend read that this is a common thing that this has happened to a lot of people mm. and of my friend and I agree believe that um it's probably just something coincidental inside of our brains that makes that happen. But there's this other weird wild theory that it works like an antenna or something. And the psychedelic drug just makes you able to like sense things or experience things on that wavelength. 
which is interesting food to thought or food to thought food for thought i don't think it's true because that is silly but see this you gotta engage in the silly stuff sometimes okay first of all i'm gonna say you sound like joe rogan no way. Secondly. No way. <laughs> Secondly. No way. He'd be into that. He'd be into the interdimensional. He'd be like, oh, maybe. Maybe it's true. I don't know. Let's talk about elk. <laughs> Secondly. <laughs> I've got five stories about elk. Secondly. And I know that you're not saying you think that there are DMT elves. But I think that it's more likely that aliens are visiting us on spacecraft than... Yeah, I and think you it's can use DMT as an antenna, and you know, one hundred percent, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> the reason we're talking about UFOs at all, Skylar, is because this is the most likely of those things to be true. Pro- probably Bigfoot too. You know, I can imagine that there's some ape-like creature we haven't found in the woods somewhere. I believe that all of the separate pieces for an alien encounter exist. I don't, I'm not convinced that it's happened. I will say that the research I saw on this stuff um, in June and July of 1947 kind of creeped me out enough to, I, I'm like, I'm, I'm 2% more like open to this idea <laughs> that maybe they've been here after reading all of that. Because maybe the stuff we talked about is bullshit, like how it all connects together. But it seems like it's connected in some way. I mean, maybe if it, even if it's not specifically an alien encounter, then there's something about the way that our brains work that we... Uh, it, it's almost... I don't know what's scarier. If there's something going on wrong with our brains, then we need to figure that shit out too. But yeah. there's definitely <laughs> something going on because we... I mean... I think it's external because we have photographs and stuff. So there's man. photographs and radar evidence. That's something yeah. we should discuss. I think we should take a break and then maybe talk about what we're going to talk about later. But the most intriguing stuff, in my opinion, is coming up because at this point, pretty much everything is eyewitness. There's some corroborating evidence for the stuff that you know we've we've discussed but i i would consider the kenneth arnold incident to be the beginning of a series of incidents that happened that kept happening until july 12th and part of the reason i feel that way is because um the the crafts really do look alike based on his explanation and the photograph we get and then the stuff happening in Tulsa is basically on a somewhat straight line, you know, from um, you've got New Mexico or Arizona, then New Mexico, then Oklahoma. It's a lot of it just, um, I mean, ultimately, I don't have any evidence for it, except that it makes more sense to group these things together. But we, we will have the hard evidence, the data. I think not to prove that aliens are coming here, but that there is something. Yeah. I mean, there's something going on. I wish I knew what the boring ass explanation was though. Me too, but I'll settle for the, uh, the extraordinary explanation. <laughs> 